let's get started. So what we'll do is talk about blockchain. It's kind of the hype topic of the moment. It's like the PKI of um, the 2010s. So before I start the lecture, I want to thank Frederick Ficartu and Greg the, Greg the George Janesis because I borrowed quite some of their slides. I also made some of my own, but um, it starts very, very basic. Of course, you all know what the one-way function is, but that's the beginning. Without the one-way function or a hash function, you can't have this stuff. So this is 70s. Um, and then digital signatures. I presume that you all know about this as well. It's also pretty interesting to find Donald Trump's signature. You just Google it, and you can find it, and you can make any document you want. OK, this is 1975. It's another building block. Um, and then Merkle trees. So Merkle is one of the most creative people in cryptography. He actually independently invented public key crypto, but he was unlucky because his professor didn't understand his rambling, because his papers can be a bit rambling sometimes, but he's a brilliant guy. And so his paper was rejected, inventing public key crypto. Um, and then he actually, when of course Hellman saw his paper, Hellman realized what a bright guy this was. And so Merkel went on to do many good things. Unfortunately, he left crypto pretty early, now works in micro machines. But so what he invented in 79 is a Merkle tree, is you take a bunch of values you want to authenticate and you hash them in a tree. And so you only have to protect now the root. So you can actually protect gigabytes by protecting a short string. And then if you want to prove a value is in the tree, you just have to show a path. So if you want to prove x3 is in the tree, you only need x4, x12, and x5, 6, 7, 8. And then you can, with hashes, prove that indeed your value x3 is in the tree. So it's logarithmic number of values you can show something is uh, in a tree. It's a very cool concept. And then around 1990, um, people realized that lab books, which were physical books to where engineers would write down what they've been doing, were becoming replaced by electronic versions, and so you may, you may want to have time stamping. So the idea was that a company would collect, uh, from all its engineers, their work of the day, would hash it in a Merkle tree, and would then send it to a company. This company would actually hash everything together they got that day, and would hash this, start with zero, and would combine this value to get the first output. Then the next day they would do the same thing again and again, and so they would actually build a whole record of what happened, a log file, where everything is hashed together. And so if you then come up with the right values, you can prove that something existed, say, between T1 and T2, because these values T1 and T2, you would publish them, for example, in the New York Times. That was the business model. Um, and so this is how you can authenticate things just with a hash function. And this company actually was created, and their slogan is, you can't trust us because you don't have to. Because in fact, you don't, they can't cheat. If they include everything, they cannot later on go back and change reality unless they can break the hash function. So this company is called Surety Technologies, started in 94, uh, based on patents from Stuart Haber and Cornetta. Um, it never became really successful, it still exists. But I think if they would now go to the venture capitalists and say we do blockchain, they probably would get heaps of money, right? So, but they kind of kept moving, being in there. They went under a few times because, or almost, but they, 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 they're kept alive now. And then something else is more, something in our group to show that this research keeps going. So we, we looked also at authentication, but what you sometimes have, and this was motivated by the health sector, is that you want to know who has access to your medical data, right? You want to know this. The hospital should be able to tell you, but then you may not want everybody to know this. So you said that maybe the patient should know it, and maybe his doctor should know, and maybe the partner of the patient, but nobody else. So how can you have this logging thing with privacy, which means that you have selective access to data, and, but you can't cheat about it. And so this is something we've been working on in the framework of an EU project, and there is still plans to, to spin this, out, this technology out at some stage. So this is technology now working in the cloud today. So now to something completely different, so payment, because if you want to understand Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is, of course, the source of blockchain, you have to understand payment. So of course, payments, are very old as a system. It's a way to transfer value, and we have many of those. Of course, we have cash, letters of credit, checks, bank transfer, debit cards, and so on. Payments cost money. Of course, cash has a very big cost. In Belgium, 10 years ago, even a cost of lives. I mean, people getting shot or bombed even by criminals. So Producing money costs money, handling money costs money, so in fact, we, we seem to assume it should all be free, but in fact, cash is very expensive to society. Okay, and then they have different security properties, so for example, can you forge cash? 
or do they give privacy? So coins have quite some good privacy. Banknotes don't because they have a number. And what is known is that the average banknote travels one and a half hands before it goes back to the bank. So in fact, the bank knows or could know very easily based on these numbers where you spend your money. Unless you organize money exchange parties where you're with your friends, you swap banknotes, uh, you could actually have a mixed network. This is a technique that would work. Of course, it would also be a very good technique for people who forge money to spread their money and not, get, not go to jail, right? So it's a, it's a matter of trust again. So cash, of course, is still important. It's a bearer instrument, which means that the person who holds the cash owns it. And if you lose it, it's gone. It's, by the way, Bitcoin has the same property that, you know, if you, you have a Bitcoin, but you lose the private key, well, then your money is gone. Uh, it's very nice that even if there is no power or internet, you can still pay with cash. This is a very nice property, which some payments don't have. You can't use it for high value. Um, it's kind of private, but as I told you, not for notes. And it seems to be widely accepted. I get by with this, so it's actually nice to use cash. So for the banks, there is the cost of transport and the risk of forgery. We'll show you some examples. Uh, for users, your cash can be stolen. Okay. And you have all this change thing, in, in especially for smaller amounts. You have to deal with all these coins and you get these big wallets, right? This is annoying. Um, and you have to be there. So even if you have a 100 euro note, if you want to buy something on the internet, you can't, right? So there is no way to make a photo of it and send it over and actually, um, that would be really great, but no. Government, um, it's still a mystery to me why governments bring out things like 500 euro notes, because one thing they don't want you to do is pay large amount in cash because this is perfect for money laundering. Okay, so I think they will disappear. So there is more of a problem because technology keeps changing and forging money becomes a lot easier. So the euro, we are kind of in good shape. Um, I was somewhat involved in, in some of the security features, but of course I never found out everything. I know that some features of the euro, uh, the euro actually had many combined features because every country or every major country had to give one feature, even if it made no sense. It's also known that some of the features actually failed because if you wipe it, your finger over the feature, it was gone. But it was there anyway. But so it's not without problems, but I think the European Central Bank has been very good at hiding the existing problems with the euro. The main problem I heard was that checking forgeries cheaply was not as easy as they would promised it would be. So the features that we should have been checked easily for low cost with high security actually didn't work, but the high security features worked, but it made, of course, more cost for the bank. So fraud um, is about one in 20,000 euro notes is fraudulent. But what is interesting, and I should update this, that in fact, so the euro was introduced um, around 2002, I think. And so already um, after 11 years, they had to change the notes. So now I think the next new one will be the 50 euro one. So in fact, it's not very good track record, right? You, you have money you, with the great euro announced, all the features, blah, blah, blah. And then after 11 years, mm, we have to replace them. Okay. So in the pound, apparently one in 4,000 is counterfeit. Um, and then in the dollar, it's about one to two in 10,000. Now the dollar is even more interesting because in fact, um, I, have, I happen to have a hundred dollar note in my wallet because I, I think it's actually a very old one. I'm not gonna pass it around, obviously. <laughs> um, but this is a newer one. But if you still have very old ones, they're still the same design as in the 1920s. And in fact, if you try to pay with them, I've tried this in a shop, in a, then in fact, they come at you and the, the security starts searching you and whatever, it's big panic. If, if just you I just try to pay a jeans with hundred dollars, it's big panic because you know, they know there is many fraudulent ones being produced. Um, so interesting, the old designs in 1928, so the dollar is printed on cotton, then they started redoing them in 1990, and then again in 96, and then again in 2003. So you see that, you know, the first time the dollar lasted for about 60 years, and then for about 10 years, and another 10 years, and so there is a problem there. We will not be able to keep up because digital technology, be becomes better and better at copying atoms, right? And so it becomes a problem because people don't know anymore what is real and what is fake. And so this is a, a very big investment. So at some moment we'll end up with chips in our money uh, or with the end of cash because it's just not sustainable anymore. It's too expensive. By the way, something you may not know, this is something I, I 
I learned from Markus Kuhn, um, and he made a Wikipedia page about this. So you can go to many countries, except for China, I think, and you will find in the money these kind of patterns here. Okay. Have you ever seen this? And so this is called, he called, called it the euro iron. So this is actually a very special graphic pattern. And if you take all the angles between the lines you can draw, you get a unique set. And so all advanced copiers and scanners, if they detect this pattern, they will actually output black. Okay, so in fact, those things were made on old copiers. If, you not, if I now go to my secretary, I take a new copier and I try to scan a 50 euro note, it will not work anymore. So it, luckily I did this before because otherwise I couldn't show you the pattern, right? But so, but so it's very interesting. This is something they try to do against copying, but obviously if you hack the software, you can uh, defeat this. Yes? Uh, Photoshop also automatically detects that. Yeah, so Photoshop does the same thing. So, but of course it's all done in software. So if you people really, if you're really motivated to hack this, you're gonna write your own Photoshop or use whatever, some other features, right? But it's clear that it shows you there is a problem. And what is interesting here is that like most modern nations now use this pattern. So it shows that there is a problem in most places. Okay, so of course we want to move on. And so in the modern times we have credit cards or checks, I guess checks are not disappearing, but this is payment by instruction. So you have a financial institution and of course it's not one institution, this is a whole network and you have issuers and acquirers. So consumers have an account with the bank, then they make a payment say by signing a credit card slip in the old days and then the slip is deposited by the merchant with the acquirer. So the money goes actually this way, counterclockwise, and the goods move um, in the other direction. So this is how the thing works. This is very nice because you can do it remotely in principle. It uses the risks. Um, of course, fully traceable and verification is expensive because like ask a shop owner how much he has to pay for all the terminals he has. It's kind of a de facto monopoly and they're very expensive things. Um, so there is quite some problems with them. So David Chaum, one of the pioneers of uh, privacy, uh, actually invented e-cash uh, in the 80s already. He was way ahead of his time, so he realized <coughs> that copying atoms would become too easy, and so you would have to make as many bits. So you could pay online with bits. Of course, the problem is that copying bits is even easier than copying atoms. So this is the main challenge. How do you give people bits that are worth money, but you can't copy them? And this is the problem uh, David Sharma has been working at, so he actually had a working system called eCash. He had a company called DigiCash, um, but in the end, I think the company didn't make it into the market. But they had very nice solutions that worked. I mean, they were efficient, uh, they were secure, they provided privacy, so nobody wanted them. At least the banks didn't want them. Uh, but it was very nice solutions. So. It's very nice because you could actually pay remotely. By the way, there was even a bank in Tennessee where you could get e-cash. You would send them a check or a payment and they would send you bits that were money. And then you could use them in certain shops on the internet. This was like 96, 97. By the way, there were hundreds of people trying to create e-cash or electronic payment systems in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And there were even several books trying to summarize them, but I guess they've all now been forgotten more or less, okay? So it's of course the risk is much smaller. It's very cost effective because you just send bits. David Trump's solutions were untraceable and unlinkable, which of course the banks and the government did not like. Because making e-cash which is traceable is very easy. The challenge is how to do it without being traceable. Um, and of course it was a bit more expensive because it was untraceable. If you needed an RSA smart card um, to prevent double spending in, in the physical system. And so of course, if the banks can do with a cheaper card and a cheaper terminal, why, wish, why should they have a more complex system for privacy? This is like the last thing a bank wants. So verification in online was, if you're online, you could actually do it um, without tamper resistance. If you have offline systems, you needed actually some special smart card to prevent you from duplicating bits. So your bits were sitting in the smart card, they were money but you could not access them freely, and if you would read them out and spend them in a protocol, then the smart card would delete them. So there was some tamper resistant element known, and there were some nice features that if you spent your money twice, then your name popped up, so you were no longer anonymous. It was really, if you look at it, it was very nice. The problem was also the, of the online system, the databases were too big. They were like, you know, billions of coins. Today we would laugh at this, but of course in 95, this was a challenge. It was too expensive, okay? But it's important to remember that eCash is not a currency because if you wanted to pay with eCash 
in the Bank of Tennessee, the Mark Twain Bank of Tennessee, you first had to give them $500 and then you got eCash. And then if you paid, the merchant got the real money from your account. So it was not a currency. It was money was sitting in the bank. It was a payment method which is electronic. Okay, so what is a currency? A currency is a way of remembering value across time and across exchanges. That's what a currency is. Okay, it's slightly different. So most currencies we have is fiat money. Okay, and I gave this talk in India a month ago and they understand much better now what fiat money is than they did a year ago. <laughs> because the government suddenly said, by the way, the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes are worth nothing. Thank you. I still have several at home. So, <laughs> well, they're worth nothing anyway, but that's another story. But so, but fiat money means the government says something is worth something, you can pay your taxes with it, and then everybody believes it, and then we can use it. But in fact, by itself, this 500 rupee note has no value whatsoever. It's only because the Indian government says this is worth 500 rupee that you can use it. If they say some the next day, no, no, in fact, we were joking, this is worth nothing, then it's worth nothing. That's fiat money, <coughs> okay? And so most of our money is like this. Of course, if you would pay each other with gold or cigarettes or mobile phone credits, this is not fiat currency. This is actually real valuable things. And so there is no government that has to tell you what it is. Um, so no matter what it is, it facilitates exchange. So of course, this is avoiding that you have to, you know, if you want to buy a bread, that you have to go to the bakery and, and clean his garden or something like this. So to make it more efficient, it makes the economy much more efficient that you actually have something to remember value, which you can then exchange with each other. So this means makes the economy much more efficient. That's, that's the, main, the main reason for money. And so money has been very important in history. Um, this is a slide I brought from George Anesis. This is actually one of the oldest money found, so 3,300 before Christ. So in fact, this, each of those, this stands for a flock, so we think 10 animals. And so this is a lar very large um, and the quantities of grain. This is how people stored value. So in this kind of objects, um, value was being stored. Okay, and of course, there is always two possibilities, and this is the connection to this talk. You can do this centralized on clay tablets. This is our banks, or, so you can actually keep track on, in a central place who owes what. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Or you can do it decentralized with this kind of objects or coins, where you don't, well, the central party may issue the things, but you don't need them to be involved in the transaction. This is, of course, much more efficient, but then people maybe find out ways to forge these objects, and then you get, of course, hyperinflation and all kind of trouble. So. I guess it's important to understand that this, is all this, uh, this choice is not new between centralized and decentralized. It's already 5,000 years old. It's interesting to, to see this. So money is a commodity. So it is like oil. I guess you all know about this. So it, goes, it has a price. The dollar goes up. The dollar goes down. So you can trade it. There is supply and demand. There is inflation. So economists fill long books about this. So I'm not going to say too much about this. So, of course, the important thing is who controls the supply, and in the case of Euro, is the Central Bank of Europe. The decide, European Central Bank decides whether or not they print more or less money. Okay? So, who gets the money? Well, in Europe, you get money um, if you work, right? That's how we, most of us get our money. You get money if you have shares, then the, the company may give you money and so on. Or maybe the state may give you some money if you're poor. Okay? So who deletes money? That's another interesting question. So one thing you could do, and we'll, we'll look at this, is give money to those who have already money. In fact, this is what interest does, right? Interest means if you have money, you get more. Yes? Brian, in America, we think that your government just gives you money to take care of people in Europe. That's not true? No, not really, no. <laughs> it's just for academics. It's just for academics. Okay. I'm just sitting here doing nothing and entertaining myself, and I get paid for this, which is amazing. Okay. <laughs> So you can get money if you have money, you can get money if you work, okay? Or you can just give money at random, right? It's called a lottery. That's, that's the way of spending money, okay? So you have to have a memory. So today this is our banks. By the way, I don't know about your bank, but my bank stopped sending me paper statements. I find this really scary. Because what are you gonna do if someday the bank says, you know, you thought you had 100,000 euro, well, you only have 50. And then you say, oh, here's my PDF. Oh, I'm now impressed. I have a PDF. This, is, this will be your proof that you have, a PDF. Okay? So think about this. Maybe you should buy a printer and print once in a while something. Okay? 
So initial allocation, this is of course important if you start new currency. This is interesting. So just to fresh, refresh in your memory, and it's important to see where Bitcoin is coming from. Um, there were many attempts to do electronic payment before the dot-com crash, so say 96, 2000. Um, there were also a few that lasted longer. Uh, Moyo Nation was one of them, was a peer-to-peer -peer file storage service, was more the peer-to-peer, -peer, just like Bitcoin is peer-to-peer, -peer. so if you thought peer-to-peer -peer was dead, well, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer hype was, uh, of course, around that time. But so it was actually um, a two-person company, and the problem was that it collapsed under hyperinflation. So it was just too easy to produce currency, and people produced too much, and the value collapsed, and the whole thing collapsed. Okay? Then there was BitTorrent. It was a simplification, so it was um, more time-limited, file-specific, and non-transferable. So they, they had no full currency, they had more, a bit more control about what would happen, and so this is how they could stop um, this thing. And then the third example I want to give, um, which actually lasts very long, and it's actually amazing how few people know about this because it was quite important. It survived for 12 years, called eGold. It had one million accounts. It had a centralized ledger, so it was a centralized system. It was backed by gold. So it was not fiat money in the sense that there was actually something in the bank backing it. And so they had an international network. Um, what happened is that, of course, once you have anonymous payments on a large scale, the, crim the criminals come, yeah. which we also see in Bitcoin. And so then you had 9-11, and so this regulated um, money transmitters, so this is the Patriot Act. And so then the directors were actually faced charges of money laundering, um, and they didn't go to jail, but they got suspended sentences, and the whole thing was actually um, liquidated, about $90 million, okay? So, so it's interesting to see. So you can actually die because of hyperinflation. You can die because, you know, BitTorrent got, of course, other problems. Um, and then you can die because you go to jail or you're threatened to go to jail. So what is Bitcoin? So Bitcoin came about in 2008. Um, and it's very different from anything else. I just, this is a quote from the original email. I will explain it better, but this is the key elements. Double spending is prevented. You always need to do this, right? If you have bits with our money, you have to prevent double spending. Uh, using peer-to-peer -peer network, there is no mint, which means this is very different from any other system, like all David Chalm systems, um, all the e-gold systems. They always had a central mint that decided how to make money. In Bitcoin, anybody can make money. It's distributed. This is very different, at least in theory. Participants can be anonymous, and you make new coins with hashcash style proof of work. Hashcash was an idea of Adam Beck, where what you do is you hash a value, and you keep ver varying a nonce in the, in the input. So you keep varying input, and you hash, and you hope to find a very small number, a number starting with many zeros. And there is nobody for a good hash function who knows how to do that except for trying. It's a bit like a lottery. You keep trying until you find the right hash. And so, of course, once you have such a value, it's very easy to check, right? It's very hard to find a value that starts with 50 zero bits. You need about 250 attempts. But once you have one, you can show it to me, and I can hash it in a few nanoseconds, a hundred nanoseconds, and then I can check it starts with 50 zeros. So this is very efficient to check, but hard to make, which is actually the principle of coins as well, right? I mean, coins, you can check whether a coin is real, but to make it, you need to have expensive equipment. You have to have a, a lot of infrastructure. So this, this prevents you from making your own euro coins at home, right? It's too difficult. But here is the same thing, but anybody can participate, okay? So the main difference between Bitcoin and other things is that it has distributed generation and verification. So even Sham systems had centralized generation and centralized verification. So Sham, of course, likes privacy, li dislikes central control, but still he could not come up with a system which was not centralized. He could add anonymity to it. But of course, this is a system where, by definition, anybody can make money, any com anybody can generate money, anybody can verify transactions, so it's completely distributed. There is no central control, it's the anarchy, okay? So transactions are irreversible. So if you pay some money to somebody and then you change your mind, there is no number to call to say, give me the money back. Or I was kind of cheated. And this guy promised me a fantastic piece of software and the software sucks, give me back my money. 
there is nobody to call in Bitcoin, right? If you pay it, the money is gone. The idea is it to be cheap. You use an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer network to spread transactions. Um, a broadcast um, is quite fast, a matter of seconds or so, or at most a minute. And then it takes 10 minutes to have your transaction included into a chain. And then you should, as I will explain, you have to wait about an hour before you're sure the payment has really gone through. So Bitcoin is not particularly fast. I don't know how you do this in restaurants, whether they first, you have to pay between the main course and the dessert, <laughs> and then <laughs> you pay, and then uh, at the end, after an hour you can leave because then you're sure. I don't know how it works actually, you should try this, okay? So you pay with a signature, so you pay with your private key and you verify with the public key, okay? And money is associated with the public key, not with, uh, not with your name, but with the public key, and you can choose any public key because you can generate as many key pairs as you want and you can move money around between key pairs. But to send money to a public key, or from a public key, you sign with a private key and you can assign it to another public key. So money moves from public key to public key. And if you lose your private key, then you lost the money attached to it, okay? So, and double spending prevention is done using a huge database, a huge ledger, a huge list, which has where all the money went, okay? And now when I say huge, this list today is about 100 gigabytes. And it will not shrink, it will only get larger and larger because this database keeps track of all the money movements over time, okay? It's a huge database that's there. Of course, it's pseudonymous because if you want to do a payment, you pay to a public key. So you publish the public key and say pay to this key. Hopefully you have the private key because you need the private key to spend the money again. But if you want to hide your traces, you can make another public key and pay your money from one public key to another one. You can keep doing this, moving all your money around in public keys until you do this with your friends and mix money. And in the end, the idea is nobody knows where your money is because you necessarily don't attach a name to a public key. Okay? Of course. But you can find, you can trace back any transaction. You can make, but you don't know, but if you, well, you can trace back things, but yeah. you don't always know who's behind every public key. So what you can do is if somebody goes to an exchange, and of course exchanges are now regulated, so they have your name, then they can attach, or the police can attach your name to a public key. Yeah. Or if you're so stupid to say, you know, I'm selling X, and then you post a message with your public key, of course, if you, this public key has been used in earlier transactions, then people can assume that this was your public key and they can identify you in earlier transactions. Yeah. Okay, so, um, of course, you, the whole network is public, I will show this. And the other thing is that your client uses peer-to-peer, -peer, so it seems to contact always the same IP addresses. So if you monitor the internet, then you can actually identify clients based on which IP addresses they contact. It's kind of your fingerprint. So there is ways to denonymize Bitcoin, and I think that's one of the reasons for the success. Okay, so I'll skip the video. So this summarizes this. So every coin, goes from transaction to transaction, okay? And you can keep tracing it, okay? This is the, the principle. So there's a complete database of what has been paid to whom and you can follow this. So explaining Bitcoin to a new person is very hard because you have to claim it five times and only after five times all the puzzles fall into place. It's really not so easy to explain it, okay? So what is a transaction? You have a number of senders or inputs which are public keys which have money attached, okay? So and they go to one or more outputs. And of course, to involve an input in a public key, you have to sign with a corresponding private key, and then you sign to a, a public key. And so the next time, if you publish your public key, you'll receive the money, and then with the private key, you can send it on. But in this model, of course, you would say money never gets created, right? Because money keeps moving from public key to public key, and probably in the real life, this means money goes from hand to hand, okay? Well, money gets created, because every time a number of transactions is grouped, somebody gets extra money as a reward. This is how money is created. We'll come back to this. But, this is, but the, finite, the supply is finite. So this is how money gets done. So now I have a public key with 10 bitcoins attached. I can now sign and put my money to somebody else, right? I want to get a service from you, so I will sign my 10 bitcoins to you. Of course, if I'm smart, or if I'm malicious, I can pay two people at the same time. And maybe one person in Asia and one in the US, 
and I can hope that you know the propagation is not fast enough and that my two transactions go through. And now I spend my bits twice. Yes. But the problem, of course, is there is a complete ledger of everything that happened. So after a while, somebody will notice. And so there are some people called miners. They keep looking at all transactions and they check which transactions are bizarre. So some people spend money they don't have because, you know, if you spend money, it must come from somewhere. So if they can't find the source of your money or they see you spending twice money, they will actually ignore your transaction and they will actually not process it. And this is how your transaction will be killed. So the miners are verifying that everybody behaves properly and that all the money in a transaction comes from somewhere and goes only once to somewhere. Okay? And of course... Does that happen in real time? Like if I, so I can imagine I, I spend it twice and I get caught 10 seconds from now, but that's too late. Well, no, because the advice to a, a merchant is wait for one hour before you accept a transaction. So don't send the goods before an hour. You have to, we'll show that to you. But it's a good question, but I will see it. So you can try to do it, but probably will not work. And then also, if you do it, this public key will be blacklisted. And, and people will, if can, people can associate more transactions with this public key, they will, for, they will actually stop accepting them and you will, you will be lo lost with your money. And you have money, but you can't spend it anymore. So there is a, a collective checking. If you behave badly, you will be punished by the guys who patrol the system. But it's not one guy, anybody can patrol the system. Anybody can do it. But to really have influence, to have a vote in how the system evolves, you have to do computations. But in principle, anybody can check transactions and help decide what happens, but to really, so what you do is the system evolves, but what are valid transactions is decided by vote. That's what you really want. But of course, this would not work because then a number of bad people go together and say, we're gonna do really bad stuff, we're gonna, spend our money many times and then all vote that this is fine and then run away with the money. That doesn't work because you don't get a vote because per head, you don't get a vote because you have bitcoins, you get a vote because you do computations. And so if you solve a puzzle, right, then that's how the, the network evolved or the state evolved by solving a puzzle, but solving this puzzle is very hard. It's only if you do a lot of computations you can decide on the future of the network. In the past, you could do this on your home PC. We'll see this that today this is done by rooms of this size full of ASICs, okay? So by proof of work, you get a vote. You get to decide what are the real transactions we are not. So you decide what will be there, okay? So you can, of course, before that, you should do your job and check what you think is real. And then if you actually win, because you play a game, you have to solve a puzzle. If you win first, you get a reward in Bitcoin. This is how Bitcoins are created, okay? So no party has to grow really, really big. That's one of the... Yeah, we'll come back to that. This is, okay. So here's the history now. So I'll show more detail. This was more like the big story. You probably still don't understand how it works. It's gonna take a few iterations, um, but it's like a puzzle that has to fall into place. So just a bit of history, because there is some nice history to this. So Nakamoto published a paper, October 2008, Bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system in which he explains the system and he argues why it's actually um, secure and why it will work. No formal proof, just, um, but he never published his name. He actually released a source code a few months later and clients and with a couple of guys, they start this up and they, they mine the first Bitcoins and they do the first transactions among themselves. Okay, and then he, he keeps working on it because the system was not perfect, as you all know, you don't write perfect code from the first time, it's a complex system. And the system is quite complex as we will see. Um, and he uh, interacts with many people and then suddenly he vanishes from the earth. He's just gone and we don't know who he is. We do know that he owns a lot of Bitcoins. And it's also very easy to prove this because he knows the private keys, so he can actually move them. He's the only one who can move them. Okay, so, and so far nobody has moved them. There was this one guy who claimed he was Satoshi to get some fame, but then he couldn't move any Bitcoins, so people stopped believing him very quickly, right? So, in fact, the first four years were very, very bumpy. And several times the whole system went under or very close to under. And every time they found like, you know, an ex number three founder of Oracle or somebody else who didn't know what to do with their time and was kind of fascinated and gave them another hundred thousand dollars or a couple of hundred thousand. So but there is a story, a journalist wrote a book about it. It's amazing how kind of several times it was very close to go under, but just because there was one guy who kind of was arguing, give us not a, we're gonna make it work and this is cool. And, but it almost went away of all the other systems, but it kind of survived. Um, there was a crisis in 2000, the first boom was 2011. The first minor 
boom, then it was a massive devaluation because mine Gox was hacked, so mine Gox was an exchange. So if you want to join Bitcoin, you can become a miner and then you will make Bitcoin, but this is a bit hard today, but if you get, your PC gets encrypted by ransomware and you need to borrow one Bitcoin, you're not gonna buy mining equipment and hope to get Bitcoin. What you will do is you go to an exchange, you give them money and you'll get Bitcoin, so they'll see your email address and they will email you the private key, it's very secure, okay? There is also ATMs in Belgium, there is an ATM also in New York, so but you can actually put in real money and you get, and you put your email address and then they email you the private key. Okay, this is how it works. So, of course, what happened is um, Mt. Gox is like a bank. This is where many Bitcoins were sitting, so it was hacked. And some people, I don't know the details, claim that one of the owners actually hacked it and ran away with all the Bitcoins and whatever. So there is nice stories, so, but, so they lost a quarter million dollars. Um, and then there was the Android um, Java random generator bug, which meant that, of course, signatures use private keys and randomness, and if the randomness is bad, then you can steal all the money. Yes? Why don't sites like Mt. Gox just ask for your public key? Why they ask for your public key? No, no, why, do, why would they send a private key? Why not let the user generate a private public key? No, but if you have to pay the bad guy, right? So, you, so they, they want to send you a Bitcoin, right? So you assume you want to have one Bitcoin, which is $1,200 yeah. to pay this, to get the key for, for encrypting your yeah. PC. So, well, they have to send you the private key because you and the public, because they have to help you transfer the money. Without the private key, you can't transfer the money. What you could do is you could give also the public key to them and they would transfer the money there. That's yeah, possible, that's yes. Mean, that's, that's how it can be done too, yeah. yes. It, I think, I don't know the exact details of the, I don't use Bitcoin, obviously. I don't trust this, but if you do this, you can, you can do it like this, of course, as well. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah, but some systems did it the other way, they. Okay. Yeah, that's a wallet, that's yeah. a. You can send it to your wallet. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then Mt. Gox got liquidated. So some people lost some money there. Some people gained some money there, obviously. But it was not good. There was some good news, or at first more bad news. So several countries banned Bitcoin. Of all places, China, where most of the Bitcoin is being mined. Their Bitcoin is banned for banks. Yes? Even more fun. Last slide real quick. Or as, the Mt. as Mt. Gox is getting investigated by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigator stole yeah. the bunch yeah, of Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got caught doing it. It's just too tempting, right? By the way, um, <laughs> Frederick Jacobs, who, who is one of the creators of Signal, he says that on some of his systems, he stores some Bitcoin private keys, and then he watches whether they move the Bitcoins to the public key. So this is how I know his systems get hacked, because he thinks that people who run into the systems would be so tempted if they find some private keys that they will use them and get the money. And this is how you will know that people have been in their system, of course. So you can, you can spend like 100 euro on this and you will lose them. But if you lose them, then you know somebody hacked your system. Which I think is a smart idea. So th they have also positive uses beyond ransomware. Yes. So banned in several countries. So I did a mistake to give this talk in India and to ask who had Bitcoins. Uh, nobody, obviously. Anybody has Bitcoins here? A few people, good. So, 2015, a related exchange opened in New York, which is very good news. It meant that you could actually use Bitcoin and not be a criminal. And you had some protection by the US federal regulator of the banking sector, so this was good. Um, this is really boring, but I think very important. The European Court of Justice ruled that Bitcoin is a currency and not a good, which means you don't pay VAT on Bitcoin transactions. It's not a problem they have in the US, but in Europe, this is a big question whether you pay VAT or not, because VAT can be 21%. But so, of course, if you trade currency, you don't pay VAT. So it's an important precedent. It means that the European legal system recognizes Bitcoin as a currency. Okay? And then, of course, there was the famous decentralized autonomous organization hack this summer. This is Ethereum, not Bitcoin. But so about $50 million was stolen by a bug in a smart contract, something about recursive calls or something. And so then this community was left with a choice. Either we kind of do what we call a hard fork. So we break the rules and we say, oh, we had code made the rules, but the we don't like the results. So we change the rules again, right? That was the option or lose $50 million. But so it's very dangerous. If you have smart contracts and you make a code bug, you can become very poor suddenly. So some numbers, because I guess that's what you want to see. Um, so Bitcoin has been going to another rally. So this was the first bubble, 2011. Then there was another one. Uh, George thinks this is to do with the Cyprus crisis. So in Cyprus, there was a control on how much money you could take out of the banks. 
and apparently people then put money into Bitcoin, they could ship it to other outside of the country. Um, and we don't know what this rally, I, I don't think people have an idea, but at, at least it's, you see some historic high values, but it's fiat currency, right? It's only worth money because people want to spend money on it. People ask me, should I invest in Bitcoin? Whatever, you know, I don't know. How should I know? Um, so here is transactions. So this is important to see how this works now. We're gonna dive a bit more under the hood. So assume you have somehow 50 Bitcoin and you want to buy something which costs eight Bitcoin. So this person will give you their public key and you will pay, say in this case, eight Bitcoin to this public key. And then you will make a new key pair and you will give 42 Bitcoin to yourself, to your own public key. So this transaction takes your 50 Bitcoin, pays eight of them to one person, to one public key, pays 42 to your own public key, and that's a transaction, okay? Now, this eight Bitcoin, this guy, can actually combine this with 15 Bitcoin he has from somewhere else, and then do this to pay, pay somebody else 10 Bitcoin, somebody else seven Bitcoin, and then give himself change of six Bitcoin, right? So you, this is how the money keeps moving, but so you can keep track of where the money goes. So it's not possible to hide money. Of course, if you go over many public keys and you mix things and whatever, and then at some moment you go to a bank in the Caribbean and they, they will happy to change Bitcoins into dollars and then you disappear, then of course you launder it. This is, it, seems, it seems to be possible because the ransomware people, if it was easy it was to trace you, then the ransomware people would not use Bitcoin. So I think my guess is um, it's difficult to trace, but it's possible. So if you do a large drug deal, if you're a large drug trader or if you, if you run Silk Road, they will go after you because it's large quantities and they care. But the police or the FBI or the NSA will not go after five or ten thousand or hundred thousand dollars because that's pocket money. Yes? Uh, how very charging difficult for Bitcoin? Yes, it's just to simplify it. There is eight digits after the, the decimal point. Eight. That's called a Satoshi, the smallest unit. No, so there is eight Satoshis, but it doesn't go further. This is all specified. So in fact, uh, what I show here is a simplification because, so, no, I'll do it. so you also pay a transaction fee. So in fact, for every transaction, you pay a fee for the miners. And if you pay zero, that's fine. And the miners may say, this guy is too cheap to give me anything, I'm just gonna ignore it. And then you get stuck with your Bitcoins, right? And what you see is that over time, transaction fees may go up because the miners may just otherwise, you know, they just want to make more money and they can, as soon as the system is established, it's a supply and demand, right? If they ask too much, then new miners will start. And so there is a market, but today, I think if you look at early transactions, because all transactions are public, right? You can look at the whole history from day one. In the beginning, the mining fees were, uh, transaction fees were very small, now they're a bit bigger. So what happens is then, over the peer-to-peer -peer network, so if you want to pay the restaurant the eight bitcoins, you will then, your client will broadcast this over a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you, it will contact three or four peers and send it to them and they will send it on. And so what happens is the miners will listen and they will collect all transactions, okay? So they keep doing this continuously. And then after a certain moment, when a new period starts, they will actually start checking them and decide which ones they like and which they don't like, okay? And when a miner says, okay, I like these eight transactions, then they will hash them with a Merkle tree. They will add a nonce. And in the first day, I guess it was a zero and they will hash this until they find a small value. And so if the value is large, they take a new nonce and they keep trying. So today, in fact, the number of zero bits you have to have is 71. So the, num the attempt before you find the correct nonce is two to 71 attempts, okay? so. Of course, in the beginning, this was more like 30 bits or so, the two to the 30 operation, so you could do this at home, but today it's actually 71, so good luck trying on your smartphone or your PC, okay? Just don't bother, I would say. So then, all these transactions are called a block, okay? Yes? Is it gonna continue like this, like 71, and then in I will come back to this, good question. It's, it's adjusted. So then, your block, this block is published, and so this is broadcast among all the, the networks, so everybody can collect this. Everybody who wants to verify transactions needs to know because this is what the miner believes are the right transactions, okay? Then, of course, you have a new starting value here. And immediately, in the meantime, while they were looking here, they've been collecting new transactions. They hash them, they find a new nonce. And then again, after 10 minutes, they publish a new solution. So the, the system is designed such that the time to find a solution is on average 10 minutes. And every 2016 blocks, you readjust the time 
depending on the time it has taken on average uh, before. So there is a formula that's kind of self-stabilizing. If minors disappear, difficulty becomes lower. If minors have been added, the difficulty becomes higher. And the average time for finding one block is 10 minutes on the whole internet. But it can okay. take two hours. I mean, it, it can take two seconds. Yeah, it's, it's, a, well, it's, a, it's a uniform distribution. Yeah. So the, the okay. probability takes two hours is quite small, right? Okay, so this is more or less how it works. And so also you cannot start mining in advance because this computation you can only do when this block has been fixed, right? So you cannot say, oh, I'm gonna collect all the transactions in advance and start earlier so I win faster in the competition. So you can only start when this block has arrived. You can also see that the miners invest in good network connections because if they're late in getting the correct block, then they start mining later. And then they may also win less, okay? And so this is how Bitcoin keeps evolving. And so this has been going on already for a large number of blocks in 2008. And so this whole chain is now 100 gigabytes. It's all the transactions are on there. This is called the blockchain. It took me a long time to uh, define the blockchain. This is the blockchain. This is the chain of blocks. Um, so it's the same thing as for timestamping, but now rather than hashing documents, you actually hash transactions. Um, and of course, there is value attached to it, okay? So, in fact, the difficulty level is also part of this, of this parameter I didn't put in there, and also a timestamp so that we can check when the block was created. Okay, so there is more, but this is... So, in fact, all these blocks are public. So, um, last week I just went online. I took, it uh, was at lunchtime, 12.30. I took the last block, block number 454,179. Okay, yes. You're jumping ahead. This will become. It's a good question. For Bitcoin, it's essential. But there is other people who try to do it differently. We'll come. You're jumping ahead. But it's a good question. Um, do we have to do this? Okay, so you see here 500 transactions, so not that many. Um, the output is 3,169 Bitcoin. But probably a lot of it is change. So only they, they estimate this. About 220 Bitcoin is real money going from a to a different person. Transaction fees are about one Bitcoin, 0.87, so it's higher. It used to be much lower. It used to be, if you take all blocks, it's like 0.001 Bitcoin. So here, together, it's kind of reasonable. Um, so the timestamp, relayed by number of bits. The size is about, as you see, it's about uh, a megabyte uh, for this one block. And the reward is 12 and a half Bitcoin. So the miner who finds this solution, so you see here the hash starts with many, many zeros. This is the previous block, and this is the current block. And so the, the, the lucky guy who found this solution, the right nonce value, this nonce value here, get, it rewards him 12 and a half Bitcoin. Yes? And how does finding this new solution verify the integrity of the transaction? How, do, how are you sure if you don't do that transaction? Because the miners, okay, if you as a miner work on the wrong transactions, say double spending transactions, then what happened is some other people will work on a different chain and eventually they will bypass you and you will lose all your rewards. Well, this is forking. So you have all interest to work on the right thing because if not, you will lose your block rewards and your transaction fees, okay? So this is built in. It's a very, very clever system. I mean, this guy is really, really smart. Um, so I think I said most of those things, but I, you have them. So the different level is 71 zeros. And this is the, I think I said most of those things, but I, I wanted to put them there. So Satoshi um, made the reward in the beginning very big, 50 Bitcoin per block. Of course, a Bitcoin was worth nothing. So in that sense, the reward now per block is higher. His idea is that every four years, this halves. So we're now in this period. And so it will half again. And so it will keep getting smaller. And in the end, the limit is 21 million Bitcoins. There will never be more. And if you have a hard disk crash and you lose your private key, in fact, these Bitcoins are gone forever. So we'll never see those 21 million Bitcoins. Some will be lost forever. Um, so, and as, a, as you, your good question, so you go eight decimal places. So there is enough units to suit the whole world. There is not a problem there in, in having not enough things. We we'll probably pay more in Satoshis in the future if the Bitcoin is worth a, a billion dollars or so. But for now, um, I forgot to mention, so the total valuation, valuation is about $19 billion, which is not so bad for a toy system, right? <laughs> um, so economists don't know whether this is actually gonna work. So of course, economists know systems, but we know about moyonation and hyperinflation. We know about hyperinflation. I mean, in Germany, we have it after World War II. 
or World War I. There was also hyperinflation in several other countries. Turkey also had some of this stuff, as Zimbabwe. So, of course, Bitcoin will never have this because the number is fixed, but economists still think it's really bad. They don't believe that you can build an economy based on a fixed money supply. But of course, economists never predict stuff. They only tell you afterwards why things went wrong. So <laughs> in that case, in that sense, we'll have to see. So the question about the difficulty level was a very good question. So you can track here how it changed. I only started 2015. So now this is represented by a number, but it means 71 zero bits approximately. You can transmit it by some, it's not, you don't take the log of it. You have to do some computation on it. I don't know why they made it so difficult. But so you see it keeps going up. So here there was a, a boost and then it stayed more or less a bit stable. Then it went up again, so it means that more miners join or better equipment becomes available. But the idea is it always takes 10 minutes to find a block on average, and so, which means after an hour there is 10 blocks. The hash rate today is three times, three exa hashes per second. So exa hash, you have kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, exa. So 10 to the 18 hashes per second, so two to the 16 hashes per second. There is about two to the 16 seconds in a day, so two to the 76 hashes per day. Okay, to find the collision for SHA-1, you need to do the 80 hashes, brute force, okay? I can, can, can remember some distributed tracking of two to the... Yes, so this is, four, yeah, this was, so, I mean, the guys who found collision for SHA-1 took two to the 63, yeah. not hashes, so th this, is not, this was more complex operations, so they have to do more searches and matches and so on, but still they needed Google's help. They couldn't do it on university computers. So yeah. what an amazing power that's being used just to hash. Okay, their revenue, this is public because it's their, what they make per block plus the mining fees. So everybody knows what all the miners together make and you even know who makes it because it goes to their public key, right? So it's about two million per, per day. Of course, they have to buy equipment, they have to have staff and they have to pay the electricity bill. So it's not even sure that they make profit. But we know what they make, they make money. Some of them get income, whether they have a profit, we don't know. So in the beginning, you could actually mine on your home PC. Then very quickly, the war went on to GPUs. Then the FPGA phase came and then ASICs came. It's a bit like uh, the gold rush technology, right? You start with a gold pen and you end with pit mining. And one thing you know for sure is the guy who sell mining equipment, they get very rich. <laughs> yeah, no, so this is a very difficult, dangerous game. So you can actually, if you want to start, you can actually go to Amazon today and you can buy these things, so $2,000. And then they tell you how many tera hashes per second they will do. So this is 16 nanometers ASIC. So one guy cl claimed that in the beginning of 2015, a large percentage of all ASIC manufacturing was devoted to Bitcoin. So we were producing more Bitcoin mining things than useful CPUs. Okay, by the way, this computation is good for nothing. Okay, nobody can do everything with SHA hashes which have many zeros. They're completely useless in this world. Okay, you don't, it doesn't help you in breaking it, it doesn't help you in understanding it. It's a pure waste. Okay, it's important to understand this. Some say it's a big SHA2 rainbow table. No way. No, it's, it doesn't help you at all. The way it's being done, it helps you in no way. Okay. Well, it's a rainbow table for double SHA-2, which nobody's using this to do anything, right? It, you, could, you could maybe get some stuff out of it, but first, do people publish these values? And then second, double SHA-2, who uses this, right? It's kind of, it's not a useful function. So now I have to, yes, question. These guys are selling money-making machines, so you buy a machine and you make more money with the machine? Yes. Well, so why would they not use their own money-making machines to make even more money for themselves? Well, this is the same thing. Why do these guys sell you mining devices rather than go mine themselves, right? It's the same thing, it's a risk. And of course, it's a market, which means that if somebody, of course, you can do a calculation. There is, I have some there, I give you a site where you can do how rich you will become quickly. But this assumes that the world doesn't change. What of course happens is if you think this is a good deal, I'm gonna buy this machine. If you gave it to work, if this is a good deal, you're not the only one, there will be hundred people who think this is a good deal and then the mining power will go up, difficulty will go up, and your calculations are wrong by a certain factor. And so you're playing risk, so the only parameter which you have in hand is the cost of electricity and the cost of cooling. And so what's the best places is in China, there is a big hydro plant where they don't know what to do with the power, so they almost give away the electricity, and so 70% of mining is done in China today, and then the Europeans, they go to Iceland, because you have cheap cooling costs and cheap electricity. 
but starting mining in Belgium with the, the, all our bills and electricity and taxes is suicide, okay? Don't start the mining here. <laughs> you will make the government rich, but not yourself. Yes. That's a hard fork. It's possible, um, but the signing, I think, is a big problem. If, you, if the signature scheme breaks, then you can steal all the Bitcoins. The hashing would not be so hard. It would be, it actually shows that Bitcoin is not an anarchy, because if all the miners and the people who write the Bitcoin code, it's a small set of cyberpunks and, and Bitcoin freaks who manage this code, they're very smart people. If they decide together, they will switch from SHA-2 to SHA-3, then it would work. But of course, the miners will be very hard to convince because if you just fill the whole hangar with all these chips with SHA-2, and then see people say, no, SHA-3, you have to dump it all, I think it's gonna be a hard sell, right? But of course, if SHA-2 would be really badly broken, well, then they'll have no other choice than dump their chips, <laughs> throw them out, and, and start again. But that's a hard fork, and a hard fork requires consensus. And this is, a, this is why Bitcoin is not an anarchy, because to make certain corrections, they have to all agree. Okay, so now the forking. So there is many reasons why you can get a fork. So two miners may be in different parts of the world and one miner may not have seen one transaction or can also be malicious. One miner tries to double spend his own money, right? So what you try to do, what you may have is that then if two miners get lucky, you suddenly have the blockchain splitting. And it happens once a day because of propagation delays. I think that's the main reason. It's not mal malice, at least as far as we know. But of course, you can't tell if you can delay a transaction somehow by attacking somebody with malware and you can like have a network around them and delay their transactions. You can't tell between a delay from the network, a network outage, and an attack that stops a transaction. You can't tell from the outside. It's the same thing, right? But so forks happen. <coughs> but then these two guys will both think that they won. They will broadcast their block. And then the other miners decide which one they trust most. So they will look at the transactions themselves, they look at the miner and say, mm, I don't like this, this is a fishy transaction, I'm gonna continue on this one. Or it can also be network delays, it can be that the guys in China, they're all sitting together, this is a Chinese one, it ends up closer to him, and so he actually starts working like 10 seconds faster on this one. And if you're, you won your block in Belgium, but it takes too long to get to the Chinese miners, well, they're already starting on the other one, tough for you, okay? So, of course, it could well be that you're lucky, even with your cheap mining and you, you win, but in the, in the long run, the guys with most mining power will win. And so if you have half the mining power, you can now decide for yourself and you can actually take all the Bitcoins of everybody else, ignore all the other transactions and take all the money to you. Because you decide the longest chain is the blockchain and all the rest is rubbish. So this is how you can actually accept fake transactions and take all the money, okay? Of course, if you do this and if you're a miner, People notice this, then nobody will want Bitcoin, so Bitcoin will crash and your whole investment is worthless. So this is the reasoning of Satoshi that it's never gonna happen because if miners attack Bitcoin, they attack their own investment. But of course, if a Chinese government thinks this Bitcoin was nice, but we're gonna end this experiment, the Chinese government could decide to end the experiment by taking everybody's Bitcoin just for the fun, even Satoshi's. They could take every Bitcoin and just take them. And that's it, end of Bitcoin. So, but this is also the reason why you should wait for six transactions because, so it can be that, you know, somebody else starts mining here and like you get a fluke and somebody get really lucky twice, but there is some calculations which show that if you wait <coughs> six times, so six blocks, then it's very unlikely that, you know, you ever have, of course, transactions, this is something I forgot to mention. If your transaction was in here, it was a legitimate transaction, but these guys just ignored it, the only thing you can do is broadcast it again and hope that they will include it. Maybe increase their transaction fees or whatever, but so if your transaction goes here, it's actually lost. And so because you want to be sure you're on the right chain, you have to wait as a recipient six blocks, which is exactly six times 10 minutes is one hour, and then you know your money got through. Yes? What, what would happen like a theoretical situation if, if let's say all of the links between the continents, the internet links just go down? Yes, and then at some moment there would be a race and there is a rule, if they then get, then you would have two blockchains, but then of course there would be no consensus. Bitcoin is about distributed consensus. So, but what the nice thing is of Bitcoin is as soon as the network connected, very quickly there would be consensus. But would there be if, if, if like it would, would last a week or, or a month? Then there would be quite some damage. But I mean, it's not so likely that no, you have- No, it's likely, but if there's no way of, of merging or- 
No. no. Well, you could, of course, do a hard fork and say, we're going to change the rules and transaction between this and this date. Have the, but, but this is, of course, then you need to have a committee deciding on this, and Bitcoin doesn't have this, so it seems unlikely. but you then don't know who owns what, right? I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that it will converge quickly and there will be some winners and losers and those who transactions were lost, they can actually put them in again, right? But the Bitcoin gives, uh, in the design, Bitcoin favors um, quick reconvergence. So as soon as you reconnect, you can show within six blocks, Bitcoin will converge again. Yes? Oh, no. Okay, good. Yes, so, so we have not, th there is quite some researchers studying this now. They study like, of course, everything is public. It's even much more complex because miners are not one person. Miners are, if you have mining equipment, maybe you have only a garage full, not a big room, you may want to work together with 10 other miners in a pool and then they can actually cheat each other. There is communication issues between them and so on. So there is lots of things to be studied. And the nice thing is many things are public. So in fact, all transactions are public, so you can see what happens, right? You can also see, for example, if, if somebody pays if somebody in a mining pool, you can see this because the coins created by mining, you see where they go. And so there is quite some research now to mine all this data and try to find out what's happening. Good. So a bit of the crypto. Um, so the hash function for mining is double time SHA-2. Why double time? Because otherwise there is a length extension attack, which is not really relevant in SHA-2, in, mi in Bitcoin mining, but it kind of stops it. If you go from an um, address, a public key is hashed with SHA-2, and then you hash it with RIPMD-160 to get an address. So in fact, you don't pay to an, a DSA key, public key, but you pay to a 20-byte result, which is a RIPMD hash. And so I'm kind of proud of this because I co-designed this hash function, so at least I did something good in my life, right? I can now rest in peace. The same with your algorithm um, is ECDSA. So you have to make sure that um, you generate secure randomness, otherwise people can actually steal your private key uh, and then you're in trouble. So what you see here is um, transactions. So this is total input and output. Um, and of course I oversimplified because things are actually much more complex. A transaction is not X Bitcoin from one public key to another one. A transaction in Bitcoin is a script. And there is actually many scripts. And so it's a bit messy and complex, so you can see it was invented by a computer scientist. And in fact, the next step is um, Ethereum. Ethereum is a Turing complete language. And this gives you a smart contract. So you can do everything on the Bitcoin. And so this means that the program executes and then money moves. That's what you can do in Ethereum. In Bitcoin, it's restricted. Of course, it also means in Ethereum, you can make any programming mistake and all your money is gone. So I'm not sure that you want this, okay? But okay. So, the simple, so in fact, a Bitcoin transaction is an instruction and the simplest one is pay to public key hash, okay? So a public key, as I said, is a point on a curve, okay? And this is hashed first with SHA-2 and then with RIPMD-160. And here you find the detailed format. So here is an example of such a point and then you hash this with SHA-2 and then with RIPMD and you get then a 20 byte string of 40 characters. In fact, you encode this now in base 58 if you really want to find points. Uh, this is how, what a public key looks like or an address in Bitcoin looks like, <coughs> okay? So it's a scripting system which is stack based. So I don't know too much about computer languages, but this is what you do. You have always an input. This is a simple thing. It's called script sig, a proof that satisfied the public key script and public key script is the output. So you actually pay from a script to a script, okay? So a script sig and input is to form a signature and a public key, right? You assign something and then you check this with the public key that comes after it. A public key script is an instruction called duplicate, operation duplicate, then hash, then a specific hash value, check if equal, and then check the signature. So you see more or less what you do, okay? So when you, how do you check, an, or check that a transaction is valid? It's a computer program, okay? So what you do is you push SIG and public key on the stack. You duplicate the public key with this operation. You hash it to a 160-bit string. This is a SHA-2 
IPMD, and you check whether it's the same as the hash value which you pay to. So you check whether somebody pays to the right public key, okay, by this hash. So this is the equal check. And then you check the signature, you check that this signature is indeed the right signature. So it's actually a script with a simple stack-based script language. And so a, a transaction is just an instruction. And so in checking a tr transaction or executing it is interpreting this script and checking whether it's yes or no. Um, so I'll skip the details here. Um, so the addresses I mentioned. So I just want to show you one thing before we move on is that you can do more cool stuff. For example, if you want to pay somebody, you can have M out of N signatures. There was an instruction for this check multi-sig, okay, where you have operation M, say this is two, out of N, which is three. So this is a, a, a operation three, operation two, operation multi-sig. What does it do? Say you want to sell somebody something online, say your, say your bicycle, what you do is, you will make a payment, okay? But you will only sign once. And then you wait until then the bicycle arrives. And if the bicycle um, arrives and the guy is happy, then he will sign the other thing. And now there is two signatures and now the signature will execute and the transaction will verify and it will go through on the blockchain, okay? So now assume as a buyer, you get a broken bicycle or a bicycle which is not working. Then there is an escrow agent and this person has a third signature and he can decide whether he gives the money to party A or B or whether it goes through or not. So you can do really cool stuff. You can do things like you know, notary publics, escrow agents. You can implement this just with scripts. Of course, don't make mistakes because then your money is gone. But more or less, uh, it's a simple language where you can do this um, escrow dispute mediation where you just put a number of signatures, a number of public keys and then check. And so this a single signature becomes now a two out of three signature. So you can see that you can say two things. So the guy behind Bitcoin is smart because the system is very clever. He knows about cryptography and multi-signatures. And he's not American because he knows about IPMD 160. So this is the only, only thing I know about Bitcoin. Okay. So now we go to the cost of all this stuff. Okay. So if you look at computer science, there is the Byzantine general problem. I don't know how much you know about this, but you know you have this problem of these guys are going to attack a city, but they don't have reliable communication. And so let's attack tomorrow. That's the message sent to the other guy. Of course, if the message doesn't arrive, then, and he attacks alone, then he will be defeated. So of course, the solution is, so he sends a message, and the other guy sends an acknowledgement, yeah. right? But then if the acknowledgement doesn't arrive, what happens then, and so on. So it's kind of not solvable. And there is lots of theory research about, you know, on the which kind of synchronous models and which kind of cool things. But in fact, nobody had a practical solution to have distributed consensus. There is kind of, there is solutions that are kind of inefficient and, and, and kind of, you always make assumptions because you can't make it work without assumptions. There's lots of research, but there was zero deployment. So there was thick books about it, but no deployment. And so suddenly this guy comes around and implements something that does this. This is a pretty consensus because you can agree between guys in China, Iceland, the US, Hawaii, Africa, you can agree which consensus are valid or not together. And somehow the system converges and Bitcoin is designed to converge quickly. Of course, you pay a price for this, namely at this moment, 3.26 times 10 to the 18 hashes per second. So I did some quick calculations and this is about 320 megawatts, okay? So, of course, we don't know what kind of ASICs are being used, but it's typically something like a tenth of a watt per gigahertz per second. Um, so it's a third of a nuclear plant. Um, and if you have cheap electricity, so 10 cents per kilowatt hour, you can only dream of this in Belgium, um, then you spend about $5,000 on electricity. Okay? Um, so, and 12 and a half Bitcoin is about $12,000. So you get some transaction fees. So you may break even, of course, as, as you do the calculation, I'm not the only one who does this, and then the difficulty goes up because more people join and then you pay more electricity. So whether these guys make a profit or not, we don't know. But if you want to find out, there is this website where you can find out whether you should join the Bitcoin race or not, okay? But be very careful. Um, what I heard a venture capitalist saying is, so far, most people have made money, not because this calculation made sense, but because the price kept going up. And so even if they were way off and they didn't estimate correctly the competition coming in and the costs increasing. If the Bitcoin price keeps going up, even if you're all stupid and you can't calculate and you assume that there is nobody else, you'll still make money, right? It's like the gold rush, whatever you sell, if there is gold, 
and the gold price goes up or more gold is being found, the guys who sell stuff or the guys who work on it will be good. It's only when there is a problem that, of course, they all lose money. So this 320 megawatt does 200,000 transactions per day, which is about 2.8 per second. That's uh, what most people say, yes. <laughs> so Visa does a few thousand transactions per second. So this is three times three orbits of magnitude less. And I don't think the, the Visa system uses 320 megawatt, even if you count all their terminals and all their servers. Maybe, but at least it's also three orbits of magnitude. Okay. So now a stupid thing to say is, okay, we just have to upscale scale up um, Bitcoin by terms of magnitude, so if you have 320 gigawatt, then we'll be fine. Just build a few hundred nuclear power plants. Uh, this is not how it works. Because in fact, you can put more transactions in a block, yeah. but then the blocks become bigger, and then the problem is that the network will fork faster because of propagation delays. So it's actually quite difficult, and there has been a big fight about this in the Bitcoin community, whether I should increase the block or not. And uh, for now, the answer is no. So there is some people who say that they have a solution called side chains, which means you have your own mini blockchain. And then once you are done with a few transactions on those, a few thousands or 10,000, you then bring this into the blockchain. So it's a level of indirection. Of course, it means you have to have local consensus. It's going to make it the code more complex, going to make the system more complex. So <coughs> it's a cool idea. You can look at the talks about it and look at slides and, and, and read articles. But you know, let's see whether it works. But at least. The way it is now, it will not scale to anything usable uh, in the real world. We have to change it. So to wrap up about Bitcoin as money, who controls the money? Well, it's actually software. And the formula created by Satoshi, and so the supply is finite. Who gets the money? Well, you get money if you verify transactions and mine blocks, okay? Who deletes money? Those idiots who lose their private keys. Okay, but the rest, no money is being deleted. Okay, it stays there. Um, how do you make sure that you always remember who has much money? Well, there is this blockchain, and we can all check this. It's about 100 gigabyte, but it keeps growing. Yeah. Right? And it's, so this is a problem. If you, of course, increase the block size, then the blockchain grows even faster. So today, on a mobile phone, you cannot, in a reasonable time, check a transaction to these beginnings, because loading this blockchain and then doing all the things. It will. So what you have to do is you have to outsource to somebody else. Okay, so, and so, like I'm also with it, and so the beginning, the guys in the beginning got more money. It's quick and anonymous, but I already hinted that your Bitcoin client contacts fixed IP addresses, that's one problem. The other problem is that, of course, you can keep following the money, and so some academic researchers looked at the Bitcoin haste on a gambling site, and so they wrote a very nice paper four years ago, in which they showed how they could analyze the graph. Also, Adi Shamir wrote a very nice paper to students showing how you can analyze the graph, and you can find out a lot about Bitcoin and Bitcoin payments by analyzing the graph, including there is many people who somehow, at some stage, publish their name next to their address, their pay public keys, and so this is how you can be analyzed. So one speculation why Bitcoin was so successful in the beginning was, of course, that there is the, the um, Cyprus story, maybe money controls in other countries like China, because it's forbidden for banks in China, but not for users yet. But it's also Silk Road. Of course, it is obvious that Silk Road was used to buy drugs online, and so the payment side you could make anonymous. So my take on this is the following. The users were happy to buy on Silk Road with Bitcoin because they thought they would hide their traces. The FBI was very happy about this because they had enough resources to analyze the graph and find out where the big shots were, <coughs> and maybe some small guys. So it was a very interesting combination. So the criminals or drug buyers and sellers think they're anonymous, so they go ahead and do their business. And the police knows that, well, if we really want to, we're gonna catch the big fish. So let them, let them play their game, and at the right moment, we'll intervene and use our weapons, right? And so this is why I think it created, a, it created actually a big boom, and then of course a bust, but it may have helped Bitcoin to survive and become popular. And so now there is actually quite some shops and um, restaurants and so on in places that accept Bitcoin. Yes? Well, so did, it, was it, did it have any relevance, uh, the end of the Silk Road, did it have any relevance to Bitcoin? Mm. Uh, 
You probably see, I mean, I don't have time to do this, but there may be papers, but if not, you can do it yourself, right? You look at your newspaper articles and you look at the exchange rate, you look at uh, the transaction volumes, probably you can see this, right? It's all public data. I don't know the answer, but my, my answer is probably, and anybody who has time can do the research because everything is public. So you can do this. So a big problem for users is where to store their bitcoins. If you store them on your hard disk, if your machine gets owned, then you're done. You know, I think an addition to ransomware will be before encrypting everything, first steal the Bitcoin private keys and get that money, right? If ransomware people are intelligent, this is gonna be a new feature of the next ransomware that they first steal the Bitcoins and then encrypt your hard disk. You know? So by the time you actually pay the Bitcoin, you get your hard disk back, but your Bitcoins are gone. Is this recorded? I don't wanna inspire people to do bad things. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gonna happen anyway. Okay, so. So you have to store a private key. So one solution people have is just a paper wallet. You just print the keys and you store this in your vault. This is pretty secure. Of course, then you have to make sure that you don't lose the paper copy or you don't give access to the wrong people. Um, there is quite some people who are building hardware wallets. Okay. You can also outsource this. There's so some companies who say, oh, give us your private keys. We'll manage all your payments uh, for a small <coughs> fee. Of course, they probably do a good job, but uh, the risk is that this is not a real <coughs> business and that once they've collected a million Bitcoins, they just disappear and then there you are, right? And again, in Bitcoin, there is nobody you can call when your Bitcoins are gone. There is no number you can call, okay? You can hash any number and call that number, but nothing is gonna happen. <laughs> so, you should avoid reuse. So, in fact, something what people came up with is a very nice thing. So, in fact, that you have this master seed, which you may be printing and storing in your safe. And then you have a tool that actually generates master notes and then wallet accounts and wallet chains. So you can even give money to your kids or your family members. And so that even if one of those gets leaked on a device, you cannot go back. But if you lose the device and it crashes, you can compute it again. So this is kind of, people are actually, in the name of Bitcoin, working on key management, which is good. Because in Bitcoin, money is our keys and they actually have to be dealt with by users. So people now work on the problem, how can I help users manage keys? Which is actually a problem which cryptographers also find useful. So in that sense, Bitcoin has not only solved this with consensus in a kind of exotic way, but it has. It also now stimulates people to think about how to store keys in an easy to use way. Okay, and of course some people also try to make, become rich with this. So, <coughs> success inspires, of course, envy or maybe make people creative. So many people said, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make my own coins, the altcoins, okay? There is hundreds. They typically have a different monetary policy. So maybe, you know, you have a coin where 1% of the money disappears every year. It's kind of a, you create artificial inflation. Or you could also have a system where everybody who has money gets, you know, 5% extra each year. You try to create a system where having money gives you more money. Or you could have a system where who decides which transactions to include? Well, you have a voting system and the more coins you have, the more votes you have. That like this is called proof of stake, which means the more coins you have, <coughs> the more you have to say in the vote to in include or exclude the transaction. It makes sense because if you have many coins and you make bad decisions, then the currency will actually in the end go down and you will lose your money. So the guys who have most money are the best. Of course, in, it doesn't sound very good because we go back to 19th century here when the rich people had more votes than the poor people, right? So who had no votes or the rich people had multiple votes, the more land you had. So, but of course, it makes some sense if you want to create a stable system. Of course, if you look at fairness, it's another thing. But people are now reinventing the history of money. You can now create your own currency and try to become rich. So this is actually fantastic. Um, a very nice thing is that cryptographers have shown that you can improve the Bitcoin anonymity by mixing, having a mix where people come together. So you have 10 parties, you put in your Bitcoins and you get out the same values but under different public keys and you keep doing this and then the FBI actually cannot find you unless they arrest half of Europe, right? Or half of the US. So that's a possibility. But of course there is a trust issue. People in these mixes can cheat and so on. So it's, it's tricky. But then zero cash was invented and zero cash is truly anonymous and actually use their knowledge proofs. So you don't show a transaction from one key to another. You just prove that you own a private key and that you put money in another public and you prove that everything is correct but you don't reveal anything. 
So you can check everything, but you don't learn everything about specific amounts or specific keys or whatever. It's very cool stuff. Of course, if this ever becomes big, the police will stop it or the governments will stop it because it can be used for global money laundering. So people try to change the proof of work algorithm to S-Script. So there is, I, I spoke about this when I was discussing password hashing and this has increased the interest. So in the beginning, Bitcoin could be, was democratic. Everybody could actually use it. Today, Bitcoin is only for the big miners. So if you would take a hash function, which is hard to optimize in hardware, so only uses two gigabyte of memory or whatever RAM people have these days, plus eight cores, then everybody with the same footing. And so you want to use memory as much as possible and you want to make it very hard to go faster, except for investing in about the same hardware. Okay, so Litecoin has faster blocks. So faster blocks is a problem because then you have more forks. Okay, so this is the map of the altcoins. So if you don't know what to do tonight, uh, you'll get the slide, so you can actually, there is more than 700, and this is like a, a map of them. And so they've been grouped by type and by attempts, and of course, most of them have died by now, but you know. <coughs> this is a, a subject for academic archaeology um, <laughs> in 10 years to see who tried to get rich which way, right? So here's just more details. So Litecoin has much shorter blocks. Dogecoin at every 10 to the second use S-Script. Um, Frycoin had negative interest rates. So different consensus mechanisms for hashing, proof of stake I discussed, um, and so on. Then dual purpose mining. So people said that we should mine for the good of humanity to find primes. This makes life much better. Um, also protein folding and so on. People have been trying stuff. I'm not sure what actually it works effectively, but you can prove you did it, but okay. And then anonymity I discussed as well. There is like a mixing mechanisms. There is zero cash um, and so on. So there is quite some research, of course, if you start a new currency and you want to start up in your basement and you use the same hash as Bitcoin, what will happen is the following. The Bitcoin miners say, are you trying something? Zap, and they will just kill your currency within a few seconds by using their power. They will just go for a few seconds with two to the 70 operations against you and you're done. Right? So you have to use a different mining mechanism because Bitcoin is so powerful. If you annoy them, they can just take all your money and run within a few and they will do it. They have been shown to do it. You know, it's just, this is annoying, go away. You know, this kind of, will kill you. Do something else. So this is learn your lesson. If you want to start something new, don't use the Bitcoin proof of work because they will not let you. This is their proof of work um, and they're very powerful. There. So academics now start looking at this question and they ask a question, is Bitcoin incentive compatible? What means incentive compatible? It means that there is no incentive for people to start misbehaving. For example, how could you misbehave? You find a block, but rather than publishing it, you actually keep working on the next block and nobody else can do it, right? And so maybe you can keep four blocks or five blocks secret. And if you have enough mining power, maybe you gain more share of the whole income than you should, okay? This is called, um, so you keep your block secret. This is one strategy. So does it converge? So we discussed this question. So how fast it converge? And Bitcoin, this you can show on a certain models it converge. Fairness, you cannot be shown. Okay, so in general, we don't know whether it's fair. And liveliness, it means it will never die. And again, this is a bit of an issue. So this is called selfish mining, where you keep your mining blocks. In the Sibyl attack, you try to kill some transactions or you try to flood out some miners. So you try to take control of the network, okay? or you can try to bribe. So for example, you could try to bribe some other miners to deviate from the protocol. You give them money for it, so they gain. But in the end, you gain more in the end, and all the rest loses. And so Joe Bono wrote a very nice paper about this at Financial Crypto last year to show that actually um, bribery is efficient, which means in the current system, if you would bribe miners, and they would be so foolish to accept your money, they would be better off you would be better off and the rest would lose. So you can actually undermine Bitcoin with much less mining power than 50% by using bribery. Now, there is several people who have shouted and say, I have a proof of security of Bitcoin. So Joe Bono calls this, if I have a round cow or if a cow was round proofs. So if a cow was round, then indeed Bitcoin is incentive compatible. Unfortunately, cows are not round. And so we, for a real model where there is bribery and other things, propagation delays and network manipulation, we can't show, we don't understand why Bitcoin works as it is. 
And probably in 20 years, academics are still writing papers about this. It's a very difficult problem. You had a comment, Jim, or? I was gonna ask, what the heck is your round cow all about, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, if a cow was round, we knew how to prove Bitcoin I itself. I really clear, I traveled like 6,000 miles to be here, and I'm Googling round cow. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> so, you can do Bitcoin contracts, like people want to, for example, attach to Bitcoin or also to other networks, the ownership of digital art. So you could create some piece of software or some electronic display and say, only I have the private key, only I am the real owner. So of course, galleries who sell hot air, they're very good, they jump on this and this is very cool, right? You go to people with lots of money and you sell them now digital art originals and you charge them many Bitcoins for it. Um, so people look at decentralized consensus, name coin for naming, Ethereum, um, they actually have a Turing complete language. So, what, uh, yeah. which means that, they, I mean, in Bitcoin, I showed you a few instructions. Mm -hmm. and in Ethereum, you can do anything. It's a programming language. Yeah. You can achieve anything. So, for example, you can say, um, I will pay you two Bitcoins if the New York Times shows this headline, the Wall Street Journal has shows this yeah. value for the short shares, whatever, and if the moon, what, you can make all kinds of statements. <laughs> if they can be checked by computer, then this company will execute and the money will move automatically. Okay, so computer scientists think that they can replace all the bankers and all the lawyers with this. We have seen this before and it didn't work, but it's interesting, right? Yeah. So there is... Um, there's, there's, there's infinite loops and other interesting stuff. People make mistakes, right? I mean, that happens. But So there is a course, um, I'm professor in the US, I now have a course, Writing Secure Smart Contracts. And it seems to be very, very tricky. Even the simplest smart contract seems to be very, very hard to write. So there's going to be a new business in checking smart contracts, teaching people how to write smart contracts. So you first create an awkward com complete language. You then attach money to it, and then you can teach people how to program in it. Okay, this is what's happening. But more or less, what you try to do, uh, uh, this is too far in, in details, but you, you represent a transaction by a piece of code. But if this share price reaches this, and the turnover of this company reaches that, and whatever the global beer market increased by so much percent, then this money goes from there to there. So you can actually, which is now a contract, you can actually program this, and then the network will execute this. So you don't need uh, anything else, it is just, and everybody can see what's happening, okay? So the Bitcoin people, that appear to be mainstream with the Behavas Rebels, it's volatile, paying is still quite difficult, and as a user, you never get your money back, so for the average user, I think, a credit card is better. Because if there is a problem, you get your money back. So most miners are in China. These are the biggest pools. So you see that they make sure not to be too big. In 2014, one became too big, and then they split up, of course, because they realized that it would undermine Bitcoin if such a pool existed. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that maybe these guys all are working together, right? How would you know? So this is interesting. So it may die at some stage, though. So now, blockchain is a big hype in the business world. If you look at the business world, what they like is distributed control because they want to be in control. The central bank wants to be in control. A bank wants to be in control of what happens with shares or what, what they do, so they hate this. They hate full transparency. I still have to see the first banker who wants full transparency. Why would they go to Panama, right? And the Cayman Islands. Full transparency is good for the poor citizen, but not for the high finance. They want to keep secrets. They want to do their deals in secret. They don't want to show their investment strategies and so on. So the financial world does not like transparency. They don't like anarchy. And they don't like uncontrolled money supply. So the solution is you get inspired by this Bitcoin story, but you restrict who can write transactions, who can verify transactions, and who can read transactions. And depending on what you restrict, you get a different blockchain. Right? And if you restrict everything, you get a database. It's a very great invention, but if you call it blockchain, it sounds much cooler. Okay, so the terminology that's being used, so what I showed you today is, is public blockchain, Ethereum is another one. So what you find in some financial sector is you have a number of players, and we call it as a consortium or hybrid blockchain where there is more than one organization controlling it. You have to have permission of an authority to join, so not anybody can join. And there is any consensus mechanism. You could use proof of work, you could use proof of stake, voting based on how many shares you have, voting on whatever. Or you could 
you could any <laughs> voting mechanism. You could use also Byzantine consensus. You could use some of the protocols in computer science and plug them in there. And so you could maybe restrict access. Okay, so George Janesis actually wrote a very nice paper last year on RS coin. So this was a study for the Central Bank of the Bank of England. They asked him, can you make a currency which would be electronic, where say a nim limited number of banks, eight banks would control the currency. And the idea is simply the banks would deal with transactions. If you can show a bank misbehaves, you could complain to the Bank of England and they would kind of kill the bank, remove the bank from the system. So this kind of, the fact that they can do this would make it easier. So you can do without 230 megawatts, right? It's what you just need is some hashes and some logs and some transactions. It's no high, t it's low tech actually. But it's a very nice paper. And then of course you have those who don't even like this. They want to just have their own blockchain to check things in their own. It's called a log file and a log file or a database. <coughs> but if you call it blockchain, then the venture capitalists start to drool and you get a lot of money. So don't call it now a blockchain if it's a database or if it's a log. Okay, this is a matter of strategy. Okay, so when do you need a distributed database? When you have mutual, multiple mutually special writers. If there is one person or one entity who can decide in the end, you don't need distributed consensus because then you just go to the boss and the boss says, this is correct, okay? Not every financial transaction works like this. Sometimes there is many players and it will, you need this. There is no intermediate that is trusted. So if you have Swift to say this transaction arrived or did not arrive and Swift is trusted, you don't need a blockchain. Swift can, can actually have a log and the log of Swift will decide what's happening, okay? And if you have to have dependencies because otherwise you can solve things much easier. So I would think that most of the financial world or the other world does not need blockchain, not even the hybrid version or the semi-private version. But still, if you look at the financial sector, 20% is seriously investing in blockchain, not in Bitcoin, in blockchain. 20% is planning to invest and 20% is watching the space closely. So this means that uh, every year a billion dollars goes into this business. Now, my take on this is that um, financial sector is com hopelessly inefficient. Like if you want to get yens or pay yens to a Japanese company, there is like seven intermediaries involved. It takes weeks to get the money there. It's really complex, okay? So it's not clear that any of the technologies, definitely not Bitcoin, maybe some of this stuff <coughs> is useful to have logs and to have more central control or central logging or, or some kind of mechanism. But I think the financial sector is scared to death that people will look at their systems and say, hey, I can do this 10 times more efficient with a database or with a log file or with some other simple mechanism. So in fact, they're worried about disruption not to new technologies because as I showed in the beginning, in fact, logging and hashing, this is 70s and timestamping is 1990. This is 27 years old. But in fact, the financial sector has been able to close their applications and they have kind of escaped the imminent revolution their back offices. And so this is why they're very scared. So they invest in this to see what happens. And if you will be successful, they will try to buy you. But of course, it's a very good time to in innovate in the financial sector because now they're open to innovation. You would have gone there five years ago, they would have said, innovation, we are very innovative. We have smart apps and so on, so go away. <laughs> and now, of course, they're actually scared that people will use some of these technologies or other technologies to put them out of business. To give you one idea, the Forex trade, foreign exchange, makes five banks about eight to nine billion dollars per year. Just changing dollars into yens into euros, nine billion dollars, right? The whole security industry is hundred billion dollars. Just moving money from, from color more or less, nine billion dollars. And it's not real notes, this is just electronic trade. That is just moving a bit which is a euro to a bit which is dollar, right? That's all, and they make nine million dollars with this, yes. Okay, and, and now suddenly, we, if we need to do large large transfers of money around the world, we can quickly convert to Bitcoin, do a transfer, convert right out of Bitcoin in a fraction of a second, and save in some cases. Well, a Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is an hour, huh? remember, quickly. Okay, it's, still, it's still fast compared to um, other stuff, but okay. But so I think that's already happening though. People, large, large money movements are already shifting yes. to Bitcoin. So, but you know, there's a whole ecosystem of people who try to go onto this. There is a Bitcoin people, there is a blockchain people. But so the numbers are on the order of $1 billion venture capital per year. So innovation will come, but it's not clear there will be real innovation or this is just a way to try to kill the innovation. We'll have to see that. Okay, so here is some links. There is a very good book on the history of Bitcoin. There is a book on Bitcoin itself. There is some papers and I'm gonna stop here. Thank you.